Hello. Uh, we are presenting a set of video series on uh, theory and applications of aerodynamics for ground vehicles. Um, this is uh, an, uh, an added material to the textbook with the same title uh, to describe some things and give a visual uh, visual uh, depiction to uh, some of the concepts that are presented in the textbook. So we will uh, begin by looking at the areas, the topics that will be covered uh, peripherally, uh, kind of descriptive form to again complement the book. The uh, items that will be covered uh, are the following. We will talk about drag, Uh, we will talk about noise and vehicle soiling, uh, experimental dynamics for ground vehicles, the different forms of, uh, two main forms of uh, experimental dynamics, that's wind tunnel and uh, road testing. Uh, computational aerodynamics, we'll look at some of the things that are available in the market and some of the general ways that these things, general ways that these things are being done. Um, there, there's a wide variation. We'll essentially just touch the basics so that uh, if a person wants to proceed in the computational method, they will have some, uh, some um, information, some stepping stone on how to go about it. The vehicle stability and performance, which is uh, very important. Uh, vehicle sectional design, look at the sections to which a vehicle uh, a car, for example, has been uh, has been broken. Uh, a school of thought breaks the vehicle, breaks the car into two sections. An older school of thought breaks it into three sections, and we will be looking at a three-section uh, uh, breakdown of uh, vehicle. That's along the longitudinal axis, which is the axis from the nose to the rear of the of the car. Then we we'll look at uh, trucks, trailers, and buses. Uh, based on the material that has been covered earlier, uh, that will have been covered by the time we get to this, we'll look at uh, uh, aerodynamics of ground vehicles, specifically as it applies to trucks, trailers, and buses. And in this section, there will be more of a comparison between these three items, trucks, trailers, and buses. There uh, will be more of a comparison between them uh, using the principle of, of aerodynamics that have been, uh, that would have been addressed as uh, as uh, uh, a benchmark. We'll take a quick look at trains, a couple of uh, things. We'll talk about trains uh, going through a tunnel, depending on the length of the train, the different things that happen, and uh, aerodynamic uh, features and aerodynamic events that take place uh, as a train moves along. High-speed trains, um, uh, commuter trains, and, and uh, uh, trains, that just uh, carry um, lots of uh, items, luggage uh, uh, in, in, in its path. Uh, we'll look at several severe service and off-road vehicles. Severe service vehicles essentially will fall in the category of trucks and, and uh, trailers in some cases, uh, but there, some are designed for, again, for severe service and some of the things that are added to them, especially uh, a typical severe service truck that comes to mind regularly is, uh, uh, is a uh, refuse truck, a uh, truck that's used to collect the garbage, uh, the, the design, and the things that could be done to improve the aerodynamics of such vehicles for the benefit of uh, uh, fuel uh, efficiency, improvement in fuel consumption. We look at off-road vehicles, vehicles that are typically used in construction sites, uh, race cars and convertibles to be looked at. We'll take a quick look at motorcycles and then we'll have a section devoted to internal aerodynamics and cooling systems. Internal aerodynamics, the flow under the hood, uh, under the vehicle, the flow through the pipes and the vehicle cooling system flow into the passenger compartment. And uh, we'll look at this, uh, Open topic, concept ground vehicles, it's, it's quite an open topic, um, suggestive designs, 
and and um, it's 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 an open-ended. This this will be an open-ended topic, and these are the things that uh, will be addressed under this title, and uh, we'll look at them one by one. Okay, uh, now we'll go to look at drug. Okay, hello again. Um, uh, we're back to our topic, theory and applications of ground vehicle aerodynamics for ground vehicles. Uh, we will be going to the topic of drag. That's the first one, as we indicated earlier, that we will touch. But before we do that, let's look at let's look at the reason. What is what is the 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 reason? For even caring to study about the aerodynamics of ground vehicles, the applications, it's, it's really important. What is the motivation? Well, the primary goals of the study for ground vehicle aerodynamics are primarily two. Reduction of aerodynamic drag and improvement of vehicle safety. Um, little need be said about improvement of vehicle safety. Uh, if we want to ride a safe vehicle or else we won't ride it. What's the point? So safety of the vehicle is fundamental to its value as a tool of transportation, I mean, uh, which, which is a very important thing. So that, that takes care of the improvement of vehicle safety. Uh, as far as reduction of aerodynamic drag, what do we get from reducing aerodynamic drag? Well, we will get uh, substantial benefits, which again will add value to the vehicle. Among those benefits are uh, better fuel efficiency, uh, because less of the energy supply will be used in overcoming drag because drag will be reduced. We'll have improved vehicle performance and uh, we'll have increased passenger comfort. Uh, if nothing else, the psychological comfort of uh, knowing that uh, the performance of the vehicle is good and that the vehicle is quite stable. So those are the uh, motivations for studying uh, this this topic. Now let's look at uh, drag. In this section that deals with drag, we'll address the following: the concept of drag, airflow geometry, uh, general airflow flow behavior, flow classifications, boundary layer, and Reynolds number. Those are the items that uh, we will touch on uh, to address the concept of drag. Um, so, concept of drag. Well, what do we mean by drag? Well, look at this guy, for example. He has uh, the advisor spread, and when that happens, this, this becomes a blunt surface, perpendicular to the flow that's coming in. It just, it just blocks the flow, it blocks the flow, and uh, so the flow will have to slap it, will have to reach it, and this is called bluff body essentially. Now, can air flow around like that? Yeah, air can. The more uh, the wings are spread back, the more the arms are spread back, looking more like an airplane wing, swept back wing, the greater is the probability of the flow going around rather than just being a block here, and therefore the greater the probability of reducing the drag. You want to improve uh, this, this posture, this human vehicle, sweep the wings back and you will have more flow uh, flowing along the edges this way and that will be less drag. So, so that, that gives us a practical uh, uh, indication of uh, what uh, drag is. Incidentally, this, this is a gown called Agbada and, and uh, Agbada can really be uh, a drag uh, initiator, actually. <laughs> but improvement can be made to it to turn it to a drag reducer if it still has to be one. Well, so th that's primarily the concept of drag. Let's take that concept and uh, look at uh, what we have here. This is a typical old type vehicle. These are the new types of vehicles. Just look at these two designs. This is a truss. That's the, the The force, the upsurge force provide, provided by the engine to 
to push the vehicle forward. This is the drag, this is that force which draws the vehicle back. Now, that which pushes the vehicle forward has to be greater than that which draws the vehicle back for the vehicle to go forward. So the drag actually then is a form of friction. From uh, statics, we know that friction opposes motion. Well, drag opposes motion. So drag is a form of friction. Drag is, in a way, friction. Think of it as aerodynamic friction. That's what drag is. Drag is aerodynamic friction. Uh, with this vehicle, every, if everything else is the same size and everything, and the only difference between this and this is the shift, especially of the leading edge, you would see, uh, it may not be very clear from here, but you see here, see the amount of drag that this is? The drag is from here to there, whereas the drag is from here to here. A little bit indi indicative of uh, the relative drag they have for the same thrust. So for the same engine power, this has a greater drag than this. Overall drag of this is greater than the drag of this. Drag, call this vehicle one, is greater than the drag of vehicle two. How come? Well, simply by the design, the shape of this, the shape of this improves the vehicle performance and reduces the drag. And so from an aerodynamic perspective, this it's a better design than this. So if we want to improve the vehicle aerodynamics and reduce the drag and therefore improve the fuel efficiency amongst other things, this is the design we want. And this is actually the design that most vehicles uh, are taking now. Uh, there are still some vehicles that hold on to this, this old tradition, but it's at least not without their understanding that vehicle drag has not been uh, reduced by that, so they haven't helped fuel, fuel efficiency, but there are other reasons that are chosen in the design of vehicles. But uh, from aerodynamic perspective, this number two is better than number one. Okay, so that is uh, uh, the aspect of drag. Uh, let's, we want to look at this. One of the things with drag, we, we just talked about this design being better than this one, but drag increases with speed. We'll look more at this uh, as, as we go on in the topic. But drag increases with speed in general. The higher the speed, the higher the drag. And let, let's just look at these two vehicles for comparison. If you have a higher thrust, you have a higher speed. If you have a higher speed, you are meeting the obstacle that the wind uh, or the, the fluid medium that's, the, that's in opposition with a greater force. So you're sweeping through with a greater force, say a higher impact on the medium that you're passing through. And therefore, there will be a higher reaction. Think of that reaction as a drag. Okay? So the higher the speed, the higher the drag. Also, the rougher the surface, the higher the drag. So a surface that's rough has a higher drag, higher drag than a surface that's smooth. So this would be smooth surface would have a relatively lower drag. Now this drag that's due to the surface is what's called skin friction drag. I will mention this form of drag. So those are other features with the, the drag aspect. Uh, you know, on vehicles. Uh, let's look at this uh, little picture. Uh, this is a drag and uh, this is the speed. As the speed increases, uh, we see that the drag increases uh, for a given surface. Then suddenly there's this flutter and it looks like the drag drops and then it starts to increase again but from a lower level than it was the last time. What actually happens is this is the situation when the, when, when the flow changes from what is called laminar to another type of flow that's called turbulence. Turbulence. So this is the laminar region uh, here, and this is the turbulence region here. So the flow transfers from laminar to turbulence. Just looking at this, uh, we might want to have a quick tendency to say, well, the drag is higher in turbulent flow than in laminar flow. Well, that's not necessarily so, because as you can see, the drag here is less than 
the value here. So there's, there's a lot of things that I looked at when we com compare the drugs, but suffice to say that this is the laminar region, and in the laminar region, the, the, the speed, laminar region is generally encountered at slow speed. The speed is slow, uh, the, the flow for a given surface, the flow just continues at that speed, and then you start to increase the speed, you try to start to trouble the surface, and you have uh, the, uh, the transition region, which is, which is this, represented by this plotter. And the, fl the, the flow trans tr transitions from laminar flow to eventually turbulent flow, and continues in that turbulent flow region uh, with, uh, with uh, increased drag. The difference eventually between both, we'll look at a number of things, but one of the differences you want to keep in mind is that the turbulent flow stays closer to the, to the body upon which the drag is occurring, uh, uh, even at higher, higher speeds uh, than the laminar flow, where we have separation here. What happens here is called separation and then we go on and have the turbulent flow. Still under the concept of, uh, under drag, we've looked at the concept of drag. The next thing we're going to look at now is airfoil geometry, airfoil geometry. So let's uh, look at the airfoil. Uh, we'll look at the airfoil in general and then the geometry of it. Well, what is the airfoil? The airfoil is essentially a horizontal teardrop. Think of a teardrop, then, and generally the teardrop has uh, is, is up down. It's a vertical thing, but the, think of this as a horizontal teardrop. This this describes it very well. The airfoil theory takes from uh, aircraft. Uh, a lot of the ground vehicle aerodynamic studies that we do these days, uh, they originated in the aircraft industry. So there's a lot of the the aircraft uh, terminologies that will be used. So the airfoil, the geometry of the airfoil is essentially a horizontal uh, teardrop, as, as this shows. Uh, what happens in the airfoil is the, the air flows from the leading edge. This is called the leading edge. Let's look at the terminologies uh, first. This is called the leading edge of the airfoil. This is the airfoil. This is our airfoil. This is referred to as the leading edge. This is the trailing edge. Uh, in defining the airfoil, uh, there are some of these terms that, I, that would probably be quite relevant in, in an aircraft wing or aircraft tail, but uh, for completion, for completeness, we'll have, uh, we'll have the terms included. Okay. This is uh, tangent to the mean camber line. This is the mean, uh, this is the mean camber line uh, right here. The mean camber line is the line that divides the airfoil into two equal parts. The mean camber line, therefore, is the horizontal bisector of the airfoil, essentially. That's what the mean camber line is. This is called the chord line. The chord line is just a straight line from the leading edge to the trailing edge. Uh, uh, camber, uh, what is referred to as camber is the, the shape, the bending of the main camber line, the, the bending of it. That is what's referred to as camber, you know, the, the, the bend, the, the, cur the cusp. Okay. Uh, now, this is the lower surface of the airfoil. Uh, this is the lower surface of the airfoil, lower surface. And this, of course, is the upper surface of the airfoil. Um, this is the maximum thickness of the airfoil, generally represented by the word T. And so this point on the top of the airfoil, it's called the shoulder. This point that corresponds to the end point, the upper end point of the uh, maximum thickness is referred to as the shoulder of the airfoil. All right, now that we've looked at those terms, and we will refer to them from time to time, let us look at uh, 
what takes place in the airflow geometry as flow goes through it. Well, uh, what generally happens is that the flow coming from here, the streamline flow that is coming from the uh, environment out here from the atmosphere, it comes straight and it hits this point. We generally our flow, the, our total flow consists of the static plus the dynamic, half rho v squared. That is the total flow. That's our p total. Okay. Now, at this point, there's stagnation. There's no flow occurring. So the whole thing here is converted to pressure at that point. This point is referred to as the stagnation point is the highest pressure point. It's where both the static and the dynamic components are converted to pressure, and it's called the stagnation point. There's no motion right there. From here on, the flow accelerates. As it accelerates, the pressure decreases from the stagnation value here to this point. This is called the low pressure point. So this is a point of high pressure. This is a point of high pressure. This is a point of relatively low pressure. And as the flow accelerates, the pressure reduces. And so we get the low pressure point at the shoulder. That is the shoulder. That is the low pressure point. Now, now at this point, the flow decelerates because the, 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 it's, it's gone on from high pressure to low pressure. And so the... Uh, the, the, the pressure here is the low pressure point, is the lowest point, uh, and the flow has accelerated up to here from here. Now, it starts to decelerate from here. It decelerates all the way to here where it starts to accelerate again into the atmospheric condition. And where it starts to accelerate again is uh, a high pressure point again. So we have a high pressure point here, and we have a high pressure point here. In a perfect case, the pressure here will equal the pressure here, but that's hardly the case. It's usually highest here. So that is the format of how the flow goes. Acceleration of flow, deceleration of flow. And uh, uh, so let's look at what we have here. We have the flow. The pressure is uh, at uh, minimum value at the shoulder. Right there, the pressure is at the minimum value. Momentum is less than that of opposing viscous force. Because, you know, there's always the viscous force. There's always the pressure, the, stag uh, the static pressure in, in, in the atmosphere. And that is the, uh, on, in, this, in this layer of the flow. This layer of the flow is called the boundary layer, and we'll talk more about the boundary layer later on. In the boundary layer region, there's the effect close to the wall, which is the surface. And outside the boundary layer region, we don't worry about that. We don't have that, but we're in the boundary layer region. And in the boundary layer region, there are these dynamics that are taking place. Pressure is a minimum here. Uh, momentum is less than that of the opposing viscous force. Momentum is less because uh, uh, it's used up all its uh, uh, speed as it accelerates to this point and it starts to decelerate. So uh, with lower momentum, uh, we have the uh, boundary layer of a particle in this medium. Uh, it's continuously reduced because so it's decelerating momentum is less. The boundary layer is continuously reduced. Then the boundary layer particle, it also opposes uh, viscous and decelerating forces caused by increasing pressure. Because relative to the pressure that's present here already anyway, uh, the pr this pressure that's present here becomes relatively increasing compared with what's coming here since the flow is decelerating, since the momentum is less, so there's increasing pressure uh, that it is facing as it's going down here, as it's going from here to here. As that continues, as the flow decelerates from here to here, and uh, 
it's meeting opposing pressure, it can get to a point where it stops, stands still because the pressure, the opposing pressure present here, the, the static pressure present, can be enough to, to stop it. And if that happens, we have a phenomenon called stall. In airplane, when stall happens, it's one of the major, major conditions because this uh, air force starts to drop, does not maintain its, uh, its stability anymore. Uh, and typically at stall, we have another phenomenon called the separation of flow. So the flow does come like that. We could have a separation of flow. Okay. So uh, the benefit of, of an air force ship is to reduce the tendency for stall because stall is uh, not desirable and it's averted by, an, by having an air force ship. Uh, so that's one of the benefits. Uh, that we have in introducing an airfoil or a teardrop ship. But that's generally how the flow proceeds from the leading edge to the trailing edge. We have acceleration of flow uh, to the low pressure point. We have from there, we have deceleration of flow and uh, acceleration to the atmosphere. And this is our high pressure point, stagnation point. It ends up an, at another high pressure point as it leaves the surface. And um, that's, that's in, in, in a nutshell, uh, the phenomenon that surrounds the airfoil, we'll be using the airfoil a lot for um, uh, the description of the flow uh, around the vehicle. Uh, the, the, our vehicles are not exactly airfoil, but they, they have an approximate shape. And as we address vehicle design, we'll, we'll see where the airfoil phenomenon becomes advantageous in the vehicle profile. Okay, we've looked at the concept of drag, we've looked at airfoil geometry and some of the flow that takes place in airfoil. We've actually taken a, a little look at general airflow, airfoil flow behavior, but we'll, we'll, uh, we'll address that a little more, uh, general airfoil flow behavior. Uh, this is a typical airfoil. This is the flow around it. When the flow uh, is around the airfoil flow, again, this is our stagnation point. When the flow is generally around the airfoil like this, the region of the flow that's influenced by that airfoil is referred to as the boundary layer. That is the boundary layer. And uh, when it's outside the influence of the airfoil, that's outside the boundary layer, and the flow is just called the stream, uh, the, the general uh, uh, stream flow. It's, it's not in the boundary layer. Okay. Uh, now, we again look at the concept of the air, of airfoil in designing an aerodynamically efficient vehicle, and uh, just to give a, get an appreciation for uh, the the improvement in drag, let's look at this. This is a sphere. This this is a sphere of uh, essentially the same radius as this area, as this one. But when the flow goes here because this does not have the air force shape, because it doesn't, it doesn't have that, when the flow gets here to the shoulder, it will be the same shoulder as this one, which is right there. When the flow gets to the shoulder, it does not have the profile to follow, the air force profile to follow. So you start to have eddy. Uh, you have to start wake behind it, and you have all these kinds of flow. You have turbulent flow, you have trouble flow all along. You don't have that smooth profile that we have. And so this is a more troubled flow than this is, and this would have more drag than this is. Uh, same radius, but uh, different uh, shape towards the end. This essentially is abruptly just cut off, and this takes an air force shape, and that makes a great difference in the amount of drag. And so we can have an appreciation for this for ground vehicles. It makes a difference in the amount of money that's spent on gas if you design following this uh, uh, compared with if you design following this, with this as a better design format. Now, having said that, let us look at uh, 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 a couple of terms uh, before we look at the vehicle. It's an almost a vehicle design that takes that shape. 
a streamline shape ideally el eliminates the boundary layer separation, as you can see. The streamline shape eliminates the boundary layer separation. Boundary layer continues from the leading edge to the tail without a stall in a streamline shape. Hence, the desirability of a streamline design. Um, again, with the, th there are many forms of classification of uh, flow. There's the laminar flow, there's the turbulent flow, and laminar flow just says that flow is smooth, everything is going well. In laminar flow, the flow follows a streamline pattern, uh, and there's no crossing the streamlines. You don't have that in laminar flow, but in turbulent flow, you have the mixing of the flow. You have a momentum uh, flow. Mo the, the momentum uh, of the flow is high, and there's a mixing of the flow, and there's a crossing. And so once you have that, you have what essentially becomes a turbulent flow. You have a flow going from one streamline area to the other, and you have trouble flow, just like you have this. This is relatively a turbulent flow compared with that. So we have the laminar flow, one type, which is smooth, uh, obedient flow, and you have the turbulent flow, which is uh, troublesome, uh, uh, mixed uh, momentum mixing takes place in turbulent flow. So that's, those are essentially the two forms. But again, there are many forms of classification of flow. That's just one aspect. This is uh, a kind of a vehicle design that uh, it takes from scratch. You can see with this type of design, look at the underbody of this vehicle, it takes that form. And so the flow comes under the vehicle between the wheels and the flow follows that pattern. Well, you won't have it that great in a vehicle because you will have the, uh, the muffler and a number of other things, the wires below, but this essentially indicates an ideal profile because of the way the underbody has been shaped. So this is a typical vehicle design that uh, takes advantage of the uh, airfoil, uh, the benefits of, uh, of, uh, of an airfoil shape. And as you can see, under here, you have a smooth flow between the wheels. And while well, our vehicles are not exactly going to be an airfoil shape, so we have, we have the hood, we have the, uh, the passenger compartment, and we have the um, we have the trunk, we have all those shapes where we, we have the uh, rear view uh, glass. So with those, we are bound to have some of these turbulent effects in there. But the closer we are to uh, an Air Force shape, the less the drag that is uh, incurred, and so the better the vehicle. So the typical Air Force becomes the background for designing in a way that's aerodynamically uh, proficient. All right. Okay, we will uh, we'll, uh, proceed to look at uh, flow classifications. Uh, this, this is a useful tool uh, as we study this material. Again, we just talked about laminar flow and turbulent flow. That's, you know, and laminar flow is smooth, uh, follows the airport profile and the turbulent flow, uh, there's, uh, there's uh, flow across the streamlines, essentially, that, that would be a primary way to, to look at them, uh, the two types of flow. Um, there seems to be a general concept sometimes that our laminar flow has less drag than turbulent flow. That's not true. That's not generally true. Uh, and, and so I would rather we do not look at them in terms of which has more drag than the other. At very high speed, the drag with the turbulent flow will be more, but there are some ranges in which the drag from the laminar flow is actually higher than the drag from the turbulent flow. So these are other forms of flow classification. We have steady uniform flow, and uh, in steady uniform flow, the flow, again, is steady. Streamlines do not change with time, hence steady, okay? Uh, and that is essentially why, why we say steady. Steady non-uniform flow, uh, again, it's steady, so st streamline uh, the, does not change, the stream does not change with time because, again, it's steady. Uh, it's, like, it's like the flow, for example, in a tapering pipe, uh, flow conditions change from point to point uh, because uh, we don't have a uniform cross-sectional area. Uh, 
if you look at a tapering in pipe uh, or the flow you know, loudspeaker uh, converging or diverging flow, these, uh, this would be the, an example of uh, uh, steady non-uniform flow, either that way or this way. These are examples of steady non-uniform flow. Now we have non-steady uniform flow. Well, it's, it's uniform. Again, it's uh, in a, a, it's a stream flow in a uniform, flow in a uniform pipe, for example, like in the or uniform cross section, like the test section of a wind tunnel. Uh, but uh, it's, it's not steady because the conditions at every point uh, are the same at a given instant, but they change with time. So they are time dependent. Non steady means it's time dependent. Non steady, time dependent. And uh, so uh, then we have uh, the non steady, non uniform flow. That's very chaotic. It's, it's uh, time dependent and uh, it's uh, flowing through a path that is not uniform. Uh, that an example for that is air movement under the hood of a car in a windy condition. You have wind coming from all directions and uh, it, it, it's just, it's not steady and uh, it's in different types of directions. So non-steady, non-uniform flow, it's a very chaotic flow. And secondly, a turbulent flow also. So those, those, those are some of the classifications uh, that we have. There are many other forms of classifications, but that's an example of that. Okay. We talked about the boundary layer earlier. Uh, just a little addition. The definition of the boundary layer is uh, that the boundary layer is a region of uh, retarded flow. Outside the boundary layer, there's no retardation. The retardation is because this, this is called wall, you know, wall, wall effect. And at wall effect, uh, the, the flow sticks to the wall and the velocity is zero, okay, uh, is, uh, the, the wall effect. And all of the flows that come relative to that, they have uh, relatively increasing velocity. So that is what makes this uh, a retarded flow region, that's retarded, uh, drawn back because of the pull at zero velocity relative to the wall. Okay. Um, there is no viscosity outside the boundary layer. It's, it's more or less non-viscous, non-viscous outside the boundary layer. The viscosity is in the boundary layer. And the closer you are to the wall, that's the surface of it, the greater the effect of the viscosity. Uh, outside, as you go further away, you have momentum being the dominant parameter. Um, you reduce uh, boundary layer, that is you can make the boundary layer thin, that's thinner than it is uh, for smooth uh, flow close to the wall by increasing the speed and by reducing viscosity. The less the viscosity, the less the boundary layer uh, thickness. Uh, uh, Streamline shapes ideally eliminate uh, a boundary layer separation. Okay, we talked about boundary layer separation earlier. That's when the flow gets somewhere here, for example, and instead of continuing, you just separate and you, you have a separation of flow, which can, which is uh, the phenomenon that we refer to as stall. And you have that, you have a, a stalling effect. In aircraft, uh, when pilots uh, go through this condition, the stall can eventually become a spin, which is deadly. Uh, all right. The boundary layer continues to retail without a stall. Ideally, it continues without a stall in a good boundary layer flow. There's a term called Reynolds number, and Reynolds number best relates the parameters of boundary layer flow. So let us look at that. Reynolds number is defined essentially as um, the ratio of uh, uh, dynamic component to the viscous component. Uh, that is rho, as we have there, uh, the Reynolds number 
is rho, the density, V, the speed, V, uh, given uh, dimension, which is usually di diameter or a given length that's established over mu, which is the, uh, uh, the fluid dynamic viscosity. And we know that uh, uh, mu uh, over, uh, over rho is defined as nu, the uh, kinematic viscosity. Nu is the dynamic viscosity. Nu is the kinematic viscosity, which is defined as nu over rho. And so when we use that relationship, we can go back and write our Reynolds number as uh, V G over nu, because this incorporates this coming under here. So that's how we have, that's why we have that expression here. Uh, rho is VD over nu, or uh, uh, VD over nu, or rho VD over nu. Rho is the density, V is the speed at which the free particle move. V is the consistent length, you know, usually the call length of the airport that we select, and we have the other terms that are given there. Uh, we want to compare two things, the drag at uh, uh, different Reynolds number. High Reynolds number, low Reynolds number. Low Reynolds number, the flow is usually uh, low speed, and high Reynolds number, the flow is usually high speed. So these are the two cases that we're comparing. So you can think of this as slow flow, and this is a high, high flow, high speed flow, more or less, because uh, the Reynolds number is not just a the function of the speed, but it, it's a relative function of, of that. You can have something that's slow and go at a very uh, high Reynolds number, and you can have something that's fast and it's low Reynolds number because it's a relative phenomenon. But we can look at that as a primary way of uh, looking at the relationship between, between the speed and the uh, viscosity. So, Reynolds number again is inertia effect over viscous effect. Inertia effect over viscous effect. So uh, at, at uh, low Reynolds number, this is drag. Come on, wow, this is, uh, this should be drag at low Reynolds number, and this is drag at high Reynolds number, okay. So we just want to look at the drag effect on this. At low Reynolds number, the drag is proportional to speed, okay. And uh, at high Reynolds number, the drag is proportional to speed squared. So we see that the higher the speed, the uh, higher the drag, so substantially higher is the drag at high Reynolds number. The at low Reynolds number, the, uh, the drag is proportional to the size. At high Reynolds number, it's proportional to the, high, uh, to the size squared. So with high Reynolds number, we see that the value of the drag increases. If you remember earlier on, we have something like this, like this, and, li uh, and, uh, and like, uh, let, let's see, we have something like this, uh, like that and it comes down and it goes that way. So as the speed increases, this is the speed and this is the drag. So this, this is the transition region. This will explain how the drag starts to increase substantially as the speed increases because it increases uh, proportional to the square. But at low values, uh, we just have essentially something like this, which is this proportionality that starts to increase higher when uh, you have uh, uh, when you have a high Reynolds number, uh, which can be incurred. You can incur high Reynolds number by increasing the speed, by reducing the viscosity, by increasing your nominal size, or by increasing density. There's not a whole lot we can do by increasing density. So it's generally higher speed, higher Reynolds number. Uh, and a lower viscosity, higher Reynolds number, or lower speed, 
the inverse would be lower speed, lower Reynolds number, higher viscosity, lower Reynolds number. So those, those are the relative terms in, uh, when we compare high Reynolds number with low Reynolds number. Low Reynolds number naturally is proportional to viscosity. Well, uh, as we've said, uh, viscous effect dominates at low Reynolds number. And uh, at high Reynolds number, viscosity is not so significant. It's proportional to the, uh, the drag is proportional to density. Uh, which is the inertia effect. So, and that makes sense. Again, when you look with the understanding that Reynolds number is inertia over viscous effect. Inertia effect over viscous effect. So, when the low Reynolds, when the Reynolds number is low, uh, you have uh, viscosity as a dominant parameter. And when Reynolds number is high, inertia, which is represented by density, is a high, uh, is a high par parameter, is a parameter of significance. Okay, uh, these are basic introductory uh, uh, concepts or uh, mention uh, for for our discussion, we look at these terms and the various components. Uh, so we have in this looked at uh, the concept of drag, airflow geometry, general airflow flow behavior, flow classifications. We've looked at the boundary layer and we've looked at Reynolds number. Uh, that would be uh, useful and primary parameters that we use uh, as we talk more about drag uh, in the coming topics uh, as we discuss the various topics in this, uh, this uh, uh, aerodynamics or ground vehicle aerodynamics.